Today is uh, Monday, June 8. Uh, we will uh, have our regular guests today, Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff. Uh, before I open the floor, before I give the floor to Dr. Tedros, just to remind you that uh, thanks to our uh, interpreters, we have simultaneous interpretation for journalists who are watching us on Zoom in six Syrian languages, plus Portuguese, plus Hindi, and uh, you will be able also to ask questions in those languages uh, when we move to, uh, to the session of questions and answers. And now I give the floor to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Yesterday marked World Food Safety Day. Food safety is everyone's business every day. In times of crisis, it's more important than ever. We want to thank those who have continued to ensure that people can access safe food throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. WHO is proud to work with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in ensuring all people have access to safe, nutritious food for healthy living. Almost 7 million cases of COVID-19 have now been reported to WHO, and almost 400,000 deaths. Although the situation in Europe is improving, globally it's worsening. More than 100,000 cases have been reported on nine of the past 10 days Yesterday, more than 136 cases were reported, the most in a single day so far. Almost 75% of yesterday's cases come from 10 countries, mostly in the Americas and South Asia. Most countries in the African region are still experiencing an increase in the number of COVID-19 cases with some reporting cases in new geographic areas, although most countries in the region have less than 1,000 cases. We also see increasing numbers of cases in parts of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. At the same time, we are encouraged that several countries around the world are seeing positive signs. In these countries, the biggest threat now is complacency. Results from studies to see how much of the population has been exposed to the virus show that most people globally are still susceptible to infection. We continue to urge active surveillance to ensure the virus does not rebound, especially as mass gatherings of all kinds are starting to resume in some countries. WHO fully supports equality and the global movement against racism. We reject discrimination of all kinds. We encourage all those protesting around the world to do so safely. As much as possible, keep at least one meter from others. Clean your hands, cover your cuff, and wear a mask if you attend a protest. We remind all people to stay home if you're sick and contact a healthcare provider. We also encourage countries to strengthen the fundamental public health measures that remain the basis of the response. Find, isolate, test, and care for every case, and dress and quarantine every contact. Contact tracing remains an essential element of the response. In some countries, there is already a strong network of health workers for polio who are now being deployed for COVID-19. Last week, we published guidance that describes how existing polio surveillance networks can be used in the COVID-19 response and outlines the measures that should be put in place to maintain an effective level of surveillance for polio. WHO has also published new guidelines on the use of digital tools for contact tracing. Many digital tools have been developed to assist with contact tracing and case identification. 
Some are designed for use by public health personnel, like WHO's Go Data application, which has been used successfully to trace contacts during the ongoing Ebola outbreak in DRC. Others use GPS or Bluetooth technology to identify those who may have been exposed to an infected person. And still others can be used by people to self-report signs and symptoms of COVID-19. As part of a comprehensive approach, digital contact tracing tools offer the opportunity to trace larger numbers of contacts in a shorter period of time and to provide a real-time picture of the spread of the virus. But they can also pose challenges to privacy, lead to incorrect medical advice based on self-reported symptoms, and can exclude those who do not have access to modern digital technologies. More evidence is needed about the effectiveness of these tools for contact tracing. We encourage countries to gather this evidence as they roll out these tools and to contribute that evidence to the global knowledge base. We also emphasize that digital tools do not replace the human capacity needed to do contact tracing. Starting tomorrow, WHO is convening an online consultation on contact tracing for COVID-19 to share technical and operational experience on contact tracing, including innovations in digital technology. As part of our commitment to coordinating the global response, WHO is also running the COVID-19 Partners Platform, an online tool that enables countries to match needs with resources. This online tool enables countries to enter planned activities for which they need support and donors to match their contributions to these activities. So far, 105 national plans have been uploaded and 56 donors have entered their contributions, totaling 3.9 billion US dollars. The platform also includes the COVID-19 supply portal enabling countries to request critical supplies of diagnostics, protective equipment, and other essential medical provisions. So far, WHO has shipped more than 5 million items of personal protective equipment to 110 countries. We are now in the process of shipping more than 129 million items of PPE to 126 countries. More than six months into this pandemic, this is not the time for any country to take its foot off the pedal. This is the time for countries to continue to work hard on the basis of science, solutions, and solidarity. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros, for his opening remarks. We will open the floor now for questions. I will remind journalists to um, be short and have uh, one uh, question per person so we can take as many as possible. Uh, and to remind you that you can ask uh, your question in one of six UN languages and Portuguese as well. So first question comes from NHK, a Japanese agency. We have Shoko with us. Shoko, can you hear us? Hello, Terry. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I have a question regarding the situation in Africa. Uh, Dr. Tetros, WHO Regional Director for Sorry, WHO Regional Director for Africa, Dr. Moeti, mentioned on 7th May that in Africa, COVID-19 won't likely spread as rapidly as other regions in the world, but it will likely smolder in transmission hotspots, and if not controlled, up to 190,000 people could die of COVID-19. Is WHO still in the same position, and what are you concerned about Africa now? Thank you. Uh, 
Okay. Um, I can I can begin, and uh, Dr. Tedros may wish to uh, may wish to comment uh, after. Um, I think uh, Dr. Mwete, our regional director, uh, was was quite clear about her concerns regarding Africa a number of weeks ago, and has been very consistent in her messaging on this. There is still great concern um, across Africa. We thankfully. Uh, have not seen a massive um, acceleration of cases uh, in Africa as yet. Uh, uh, some of that is likely due to uh, a lower availability of testing, but we haven't seen the hospital systems become overwhelmed. What we are seeing in some countries is an acceleration of disease. And again, we're seeing a similar acceleration in parts of South Asia, <clears throat> um, and we're seeing acceleration of disease now in Central and South America. So I think we need to be uh, very realistic here. We're thankful for the time that uh, the disease is not exponentially rising because it gives a window of opportunity for preparation and to do more to prepare systems. But that is not to say that the disease cannot explode and that it cannot rise significantly in Africa and cause significant uh, destruction and death. So um, uh, with regards to the absolute numbers, it's very hard to predict what the, the numbers will be. What I do know is that those numbers will be lower if we have good surveillance. Those numbers will be lower if we are able to break chains of transmission. Those numbers will be lower if we can get people into health care, get them medical oxygen, uh, and get them the supportive care they need. Uh, that's what I know. DG, any comment on Africa specifically? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan. Now we will go to uh, Bianca Gautier from uh, Globo. Bianca. Hi, Tarek. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, very well. Thanks a lot. My question is about the official data in Brazil. Last week, the first the Brazilian government pushed back the release of the daily numbers for after the country's main television news program. Then it removed months of data on COVID-19 from the national website. And finally, released two contradictory sets of figures for cases and fatalities with totally different results, bringing further confusion. Does the WHO trust the government figures and how concerned is the WHO with this situation in Brazil? Thanks a lot. Um, our understanding is that the, the government in Brazil will continue to report uh, the, the important figures, the daily incidents and the daily death figures, and, and report that in a disaggregated manner. Uh, we do have uh, extremely uh, detailed uh, data from, uh, the, from PAHO and from, the, from Brazil uh, on the epidemic. In fact, some of the data we have from Brazil is some of the most detailed and updated uh, on a daily basis in the world. And we truly hope that that continues. Brazil is a very large country. Uh, it has a very diverse population. Uh, it has some very vulnerable populations, particularly in peri-urban areas, indigenous populations and others. Uh, and therefore, Brazil deserves our full support. And we will continue to support Brazil and the people of Brazil in their fight against, uh, in their fight against COVID. Uh, it is, though, at the same time, very important that the messages uh, around transparency and sharing of information are consistent and that we are able to rely on our partners in Brazil to provide that information to us, but more importantly, to people, to citizens. Uh, they need to understand what's happening. They need to understand where the virus is. They need to know how to manage the risks to them. Uh, and therefore, we hope and we trust that any confusions that may exist at the moment can be resolved and that the government of Brazil and the states in Brazil can continue to communicate in a consistent and transparent way with their own citizens uh, in order to bring this uh, epidemic to an end uh, as soon as possible. We will, as I said, continue with uh, our colleagues in PAL to support the people of Brazil and the government of Brazil uh, to control this disease as quickly as possible. Next question comes from The Hill. Uh, we have Ray Wilson online. Ray. Hi, Tarek, can you hear me? Uh, yes, go ahead. Great, thanks. Uh, does WHO continue to work with CDC, NIH, and other American institutions? Have there been any areas of cooperation or collaborative programs that have ended in recent weeks? 
So thanks for that question. Absolutely. Uh, we, uh, we work with uh, U.S. colleagues uh, at USCDC, at NIH, and a number of academic institutions across the whole country in a variety of networks and uh, different types of platforms um, since the beginning of this pandemic, and that will continue. Uh, we have active engagement through all of our global ex expert networks, uh, which are uh, clinicians and laboratorians and uh, IPC specialists, risk communicators, um, et cetera. And so we will continue to do that um, as the pandemic continues. Yeah, and, and may I add that uh, it, it's not just in the area of, uh, of COVID-19. We're already engaged very deeply and, and working very closely with uh, colleagues and institutions in the, in the U.S. Uh, in the fight against a renewed outbreak uh, of Ebola in, in DR Congo, an outbreak, a new emergence uh, of, a, of, a, of a new virus as such uh, from the forest. So uh, managing the, the animal-human interface and uh, watching out for these new diseases and responding to them in a rapid way is extremely important. And we rely heavily uh, on our uh, colleagues and institutions in the U.S. like CDC, like NIH, and like the the hundreds of collaborating centers that this organization has across the United States for that scientific uh, collaboration and that scientific uh, innovation. And we will continue to do that uh, until uh, we are otherwise instructed or informed. We will go now to uh, Guatemala. We have Grecia online from Diario La Hora. Grecia. Thank you very much. What is the situation for Guatemala? And do you think that we have reached the peak of the uh, infection in the region and in Central America? Um, I think, unfortunately, the answer to your question is no. Uh, there's been um, an increase, I think, of about 50% of cases in Guatemala over the last week, but a, a worrying increase, too, in the number of fatalities, uh, which have increased by over 100%. Now, the absolute number is low, and this may reflect an improvement in surveillance. But what we're seeing from Mexico all the way through to Chile is uh, an increasing pattern across the Americas, uh, the, across Latin America, with some notable exceptions. But uh, I think this is a, very, a time of great concern. It's a time uh, in which uh, we need strong government leadership in Latin America. We need strong international solidarity with the countries uh, of, of Latin America. Um, and we need leadership from within Latin America to, uh, to, to uh, bring this disease under control. Uh, it's not one country. It's many, many countries experiencing very severe epidemics with what we saw in Europe and North America uh, health systems now coming under real strain, uh, intensive care beds uh, not being available in all countries to, to cope with the disease, uh, and, and a lot of fear and, 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 and confusion at, at community level for different reasons. So I would say right now the epidemic in Central and South America is the most complex of all of the situations we face globally, and one in which uh, the world needs to work and come to the support and aid of, of countries in the region in order to assist them uh, in, uh, in dealing with this uh, high-impact pandemic uh, from the perspective of Central and South America. So if I might add, just to say that the, the, you know, the situation in Guatemala in, in the Americas is very much uh, the current state that they're in right now is the state that many countries were in several weeks ago and several months ago. And um, you know what the DG spoke about today, very much of sort of the back to basics and back to the, the, the fundamental approach, this comprehensive approach that needs to be used to tackle this virus, um, very, is very much the same as we've been saying from the beginning. The idea that we have an entire population engaged, knowing what each individual uh, what role each individual plays within this pandemic is, is fundamental. How can I protect myself from infection? How can I protect my family from infection? How can I prevent the possibility of me transmitting to someone else who may be more vulnerable? How do we have a public health infrastructure in place to be able to find cases, to isolate cases, to test cases, 
um, to care for cases um, in medical facilities, ensuring that they receive adequate clinical care depending on, on how the disease that they develop. Do we have the right workforce in place to be able to do contact tracing, to find the contacts of the known cases and quarantine those contacts? Do we have the right testing strategy? Do we have enough tests in place and enough labs to carry out those tests? Do we have this all of government approach, it bringing in all different sectors, not just the health sector, um, so that we can uh, maintain essential health services, but also try to keep other systems going? And so that, that comprehensive approach of what um, Latin America, Central America, the Americas need to focus on is very much what all countries need to focus on. And we need to remind ourselves that these interventions work. Um, not one intervention alone, but the combination of these interventions work. Um, and so staying focused on that, uh, providing the support that we can through our regional office, having the solidarity and support in getting supplies to where those are needed is really what we need to be focused on. And Ty, could, could I just add, because I think it's important from the perspective of, of Latin America that uh, countries in Central and South America have a hugely proud history of dealing with infectious diseases. It was this continent that, or subcontinent that uh, uh, first eradicated polio, all three strains. It was this continent that actually eliminated measles and offered an opportunity for global measles elimination, which were unfortunately squandering at the moment. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, this, this region that dealt most effectively with the, the, the huge cholera outbreaks we had during this current pandemic of cholera, and we're still in, technically, a cholera pandemic, for those of you uh, who uh, aren't aware of that. So I, I, I think there are tremendous capacities in infectious disease control in, uh, in Latin uh, in America and Central and South America. There's tremendous level of disaster preparedness in many countries because of the prone nature for, 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 for uh, high impact weather events and many other natural disasters. Uh, and, and Central and South America have a proud history of uh, disaster risk management, disaster preparedness, disaster response. Uh, and we need uh, and, and really look to the leadership in, in Central and South America to leverage the, the undoubted scientific and public health expertise, the undoubted community levels of community power and engagement and the energy and the innovation that's present at community level. Uh, what we hope we see is the governments of Central and South America working uh, together uh, to, to fight this disease and demonstrating to the world once again the capacity that these countries have, both in science, in public health, uh, in disaster risk management and their capacity to work both individually and together in a coherent way to stop infectious diseases. So Central and South America have done this effectively in the past and I have no doubt if the right, uh, if the, if the right approaches are taken in a well-coordinated fashion that uh, Latin America has the capacity to do that again. Now we will go to uh, China Daily. We have uh, Chen uh, Yuanhua online. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, Dr. Tedros, I mean, the Chinese government yesterday issued a white paper on fighting uh, COVID-19, detailing all its efforts, you know, fighting the coronavirus. So I, I'm wondering um, if WHO has any comment on this. Thank you. I can begin. Uh, uh, I think at this point, uh, uh, when any country publishes an evaluation of their of their response, that's always a good thing to see what lessons are there to be learned. But I, I do think we need to focus moving forward. And it's interesting in, in, in that paper and in many other papers coming out at country level, we need to focus now on what we're doing today to prevent second peaks. We need to focus now on how we're going to prepare uh, for later in the year. We need to focus now on supporting those countries around the world who are right in the middle of very severe epidemics that are getting worse. So uh, I think there will be a time uh, to go back and look at everything we've done. Uh, everybody at every level, from global to national to sub-national, uh, to from technical to political to scientific, uh, all of the decisions, all of the actions taken at all levels by all players in this response need to be examined and we need to learn. 
and we need to emerge from this pandemic stronger. Uh, but right now, we need to focus the narrative and we need to focus the discussion on what we're doing now. What are we learning moving forward? And clearly, there are many positive lessons to be learned from the experience of many countries. Uh, and that's what we are focusing on right now, learning what we can, where countries have got it right, where countries have got it wrong, and how we can find the package of interventions. What is the, the package? And Maria spent a few minutes earlier laying out what those uh, activities are. And that's what we need to focus on. Does every country on this planet have the capacity to implement those core functions in terms of community education, in terms of surveillance, in terms of the healthcare system? Do we have that capacity to sustain a response against this disease until we have an effective vaccine or, or even beyond? Uh, and I think that's where we would like to focus. We will read the, uh, the documents from China, as we do from all countries, with interest to learn lessons. But uh, I would honestly, personally prefer if we, we don't constantly go back uh, and start to uh, re-legislate uh, issues that have occurred months and months ago and, and, and prevent us from moving forward to do the most important work we have to do. And I'd, I'd just like to add on the focus on the now. Um, so as Mike was saying, we need to focus on the now. Um, this is far from over. Um, I know many of us would like this to be over, and I know many situations uh, are seeing positive signs, but it is far from over. And we need to shore up our activities, we need to build up the activities in the infrastructure that is not in place in many countries and continues to not be in place in many countries. And while I don't want to focus on the negative, I want to focus on the opportunity to build these this workforce, build this infrastructure that isn't in place in most countries. And unfortunately, we've seen that in many countries. We're talking about the, the workforce of public health professionals um, who can carry out contact tracing. We're talking about trained medical professionals who have adequate training in respiratory diseases, specifically for COVID-19, but for infectious diseases. Looking at supplies, making sure that we have adequate personal protective equipment for every health worker on the planet that needs it. We're talking about treatments and effective, safe and effective treatments for COVID-19 and for emerging respiratory pathogens. We're talking about vaccines. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done and we need everyone to remain focused on achieving the goal at hand, which is stopping this pandemic which is suppressing transmission and saving lives, and there's a lot more work to do. So let's celebrate the successes that we do have, but let's remain focused on the remaining work that needs to be done, because unfortunately this is far from over. Thank you very much. We will go now to uh, Uganda Network Radio. We have Pamela Mawanda with us. Uh, Pamela. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I have a question about uh, the two strains of COVID-19. Um, and what kind of effect they might have on clinical results uh, in, in, in regards to the cases. Do we know if one strain may lead to severe severe disease in patients or it's, to, or it's the same either way? Thank you. So thank you for the question. So this is a question about the viruses that are circulating globally, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes COVID-19 disease. So there are more than 40,000 full genome sequences that are uh, uploaded to publicly available websites. And there are a large number of scientists and virologists and, and professionals who are looking at the sequences themselves. Um, there are different groupings of those viruses. You mentioned two strains, but there are several different groupings. Um, there are some subtle changes, some that are expected in an RNA virus, um, but none of these changes um, result in differences in the way that the virus transmits or in the way that the, in the, in the type of disease that the virus causes or the severity that the virus causes. We have a global lab network uh, where we're discussing this with them. This is an area of active research and active discussion. Um, and we're, we're constantly looking at the viruses that are publicly available in the different segments of that. Um, there are a number of different types of studies that need to be done in labs to look at how each of these viruses in the, in, will behave. But so far, among all of the viruses that are available, there are no differences in the way that this virus transmits or in the, way, in the disease that this virus causes. Uh, thank you for this answer, and thank you, Pamela, for calling. Uh, we will now go to a business insider. We have Hilary Brook with us. Hilary? 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Hilary. Great. Yeah, I just had a quick question um, in regards to your new guidance about homemade face masks. I wanted to ask um, about face shields. Do you think there's a role for those to play in this pandemic for the general public? And do you think people could use those instead of homemade masks? So thanks for that question. That is something that our infection prevention and control network is discussing. Um, so with the recent guidance that we put out, um, as you know, we put out guidance on a fabric mask and the layers and the materials that can be used to, to build and to make an effective mask. What's important about the mask is not only the materials that are used, but also the way that it actually covers your face in terms of providing that barrier um, over your nose and your mouth. Um, there is a role for face shields if masks are not available, um, but that is something that needs to be discussed on where and when that can best be used. But I should say, I should remind you that masks alone will not protect you. Face shields alone will not protect you from infection. It's really important that all of the measures um, including physical distancing. We know that physical distancing works of at least one meter. That is really paramount. It is really important that that is maintained. That hand hygiene, uh, washing your hands with soap and water or an alcohol-based rub, practicing respiratory etiquette, sneezing into your elbow, all of these must remain in place. Thank you. Uh, now we will go to Emma Farge from Reuters. Hello, Emma. Yes, good afternoon. Um, it's a question about asymptomatic transmission, if I may. I know that the WHO has previously said that there's no uh, documented cases of this. Um, we had a story out of Singapore today saying that at least half of the new cases they're seeing have no symptoms. And I'm wondering if it's possible that this has a bigger role than the WHO initially thought in propagating the pandemic and what the policy implications of that might be. Thank you. So I could start and, and perhaps Mike would like to supplement. So there's a couple of things in the question that you just asked. One is the number of cases that are reported that are being reported as asymptomatic. Um, and so we hear from a number of countries that X number, X percentage of them are reported as not having symptoms or that they are in their pre-symptomatic phase, which means it's a few days before they actually develop severe symptoms. In a number of countries, when we go back and we discuss with them, one, how are these asymptomatic cases being identified? Many of them are being identified through contact tracing, and so which is what we would want to see, in that you have a known case, you find your contacts, they're already in quarantine, hopefully, and some of them are tested, and then you, you pick up people who may have asymptomatic or no uh, symptoms or even mild symptoms. The other thing we're finding is that when we actually go back and say how many of them were truly asymptomatic, we find out that many have really mild disease, very mild disease. Um, they're not quote unquote COVID symptoms, meaning they may not have developed fever yet, they may not have had a significant cough, or they may not have shortness of breath, but some may have mild disease. Having said that, we do know that there can be people that are truly asymptomatic and PCR positive. The second part of your question is what proportion of asymptomatic individuals actually transmit? So the way that we look at that is we look at, um, they need, these individuals need to be followed carefully um, over the course of uh, when they're detected and looking at secondary transmission. We have a number of reports from countries who are doing very detailed contact tracing. They're following asymptomatic cases, they're following contacts, and they're not finding secondary transmission onward. It's very rare. And that not, much of that is not published in the, in the literature. From the papers that are published, there is one that came out from Singapore uh, looking at a long-term care facility. There are some household transmission studies where you follow individuals over time and you look at the proportion of those that transmit onwards. Um, we are constantly looking at this data and we're trying to get more information from countries to truly answer this question. It still appears to be rare that an asymptomatic individual actually transmits onward. What we really want to be focused on are, is following the symptomatic cases. If we followed all of the symptomatic cases, because we know that this is a respiratory pathogen, it passes from an individual through infectious droplets. If we actually followed all of the symptomatic cases, 
isolated those cases, followed the contacts and quarantined those contacts, we would drastically reduce. I would love to be able to give a proportion of how much transmission we would actually stop, but it would be a drastic reduction in transmission. If we could focus on that, I think we would, we would do very, very well in terms of suppressing transmission. But from the data we have, it still seems to be rare that an asymptomatic person actually transmits onward to a secondary individual. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will go to uh, uh, Siddhant Namtani from India TV. Hello, Siddhant. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Uh, so my question basically uh, relates to the community transmission uh, as a term itself. Uh, the WHO's coronavirus situation report 137 that was issued on June 6 still has India in the cluster of cases category, uh, despite 250,000 cases and 7,000 deaths. Uh, and, and almost all the countries which has near about the same number of cases are in community transmission. So would you like to shine some light on, on this particular fact that, you know, India is still in the cluster of cases and, and still has uh, this high number of cases? Thank you. Uh, no, I will. Uh, I'll certainly uh, look into that. I mean, India is one of the most populous countries in the world. So, when uh, when you look at the distribution of cases across a vast nation, then the actual attack rates per hundred thousand population may very, may may be much much lower. Uh, whereas the same number of cases in a much smaller country may represent a much higher attack rate. But I will have to take a look at those attack rates by uh, by uh, state and by <clears throat> at a lower level. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I, I'm not 100% sure how India is specifically categorized at sub-national level, because I believe ca India is sub-categorizing its transmission dynamics uh, at sub-national level as well, and I would need to take a look and see uh, how that has been done. I don't have that data here with me. I, I apologize. Only one thing to add. I can't answer the, the, the specific question you asked, but the, the question about classifying where a country is within transmission um, can be done at a national level, but what's more important is it's done at the lowest administrative level as you can get, because that's, that's what will help you target your interventions to what is needed where. It's not about which interventions, it's about the intensity of interventions that need to be focused on depending on that level of transmission. What we do know is in most countries, and, and in all countries, um, the virus doesn't behave the same way across the whole, the whole country. It's not the same. You may have hot spots, and, and in, in many countries, we're seeing these super spreading events, these uh, increased or amplified transmission in specific settings, whether it's long-term facilities or whether it's uh, expatriate dorms or whether it's uh, churches. Um, you know, we need to make sure that what we understand about transmission is evaluated at the lowest level possible because that will really help you be agile in the response that's necessary to break those chains of transmission. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two more questions. Uh, let's go to Kai Kufreshman from Science. Kai. Thanks, Tariq. Um, I just wanted to ask for an update on uh, hydroxychloroquine. I mean, there's some uh, clinical data coming out now from the first randomized clinical trials. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious whether, you know, you are thinking at all about stopping that arm of the trial, given that data. Um, the, the principal investigators and the executive group and, and others, I'm sure, will be looking at that data. They've certainly uh, been in touch with the, I think, the uh, PIs on the recovery trial, um, which I believe has indicated that it will be stopping the, the hydroxychloroquine arm in the study. <clears throat> and uh, we will also, obviously, in due course, have to, to look at our data. We don't have the same numbers of, of patients uh, on the hydroxychloroquine arm, so it remains to be seen uh, <clears throat> how significant the effect is in, in this group. But all studies are slightly different. All studies are designed in slightly different ways with uh, slightly different uh, endpoints. So <clears throat> I'm sure the PIs will be looking at the, uh, the hydroxychloroquine arm again of the, of the solidarity trial to see whether or not we need to uh, again carry out an analysis this time uh, around the issue of uh, clinical effectiveness and decide on that basis. Uh, but it is disappointing. I mean, <clears throat> it's always disappointing 
when any drug in any trial uh, is not successful, because uh, obviously that's a potential last opportunity for care. But we have to continue to build up the evidence. One trial is never enough uh, for, in terms of positive or negative uh, signals of clinical effectiveness. Uh, patient groups can differ, uh, situations can differ, the, the therapeutic uh, <coughs> indications can differ, and the, and the outcomes been measured can differ. So um, I'm sure the PIs and, and the group overseeing the uh, solidarity trial will do the necessary analysis and they'll take the necessary action in the appropriate time. <coughs> Maybe the next question, and will be the last one. Uh, we have Thomas from Swiss Public Radio. Thomas? Uh, no, we don't have Thomas, it seems. Uh, so we will, we will uh, go to Nina from uh, AFP. Nina? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Um, to Dr. Tedros, you mentioned uh, in your introduction the, the protests that are um, rocking the U.S. and uh, also uh, going on around the globe. And I know there have been some, some suggestions that the protesters should just, um, especially in places like New York uh, and elsewhere, should consider that they've been exposed and should quarantine themselves. Is this something that you agree with, or how do you think they should proceed uh, in a to taking the precautions that you mentioned. Thank you. Um, uh, it's difficult to, to speculate on individual situations in individual countries, but the, the normal definition of a contact is someone who's been in uh, prolonged <clears throat> close contact with a confirmed case of disease. Uh, and in that sense, uh, someone who's just been uh, at a, a mass gathering doesn't necessarily meet the definition of a contact in that in that context. So then it comes back down to local public health analysis and local risk management. There may be situations with mass gatherings where a local public health official, on the basis of abundance of caution, could advise people either to quarantine or to get tested, and there are any number of actions that could be taken. But by the strict definition of what risk is in the context of COVID-19, the riskiest situation to be in is to be in close proximity to a case, particularly a symptomatic case of, of COVID-19. And we would hope that in any mass gathering now, in any situation where people come together, that people have had now four to five months to really internalize that someone who is unwell, someone who is febrile, someone who is getting ill should really be at home and not engaged in any public activity. Um, uh, uh, so that would be, it, 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 but we would always defer to national and sub-national authorities if they wish and need to take necessary public health actions that are based on risk assessment, that are based on scientific evidence, then we will defer to their advice <clears throat> they give to their communities in order to protect their health. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. With uh, this question, we will conclude uh, this uh, press briefing. Uh, audio file will be sent to you, as always, in a coming hour or two, and the transcript will be available uh, tomorrow. We will keep sending you news from uh, WHO regional and country offices from around the world. Uh, wish everyone a very nice rest of the day or the evening. Yeah, thank you, Tariq, and thank you all uh, for joining, and uh, see you on Wednesday. Have a good evening.